So the d-block elements are these elements at the center of the periodic table and in today's video we are going to talk about their physical properties and we are going to look at how their melting point varies both across the period as well as down the group. So let's start with the physical properties. Now all the elements of the d-block are metals, right? And in metals, the valence electron is actually not attached to any one particular atom, rather it is free to move around the whole metal lattice. So we have a grid of positively charged metal ions which are surrounded by a sea of electrons and this negative sea of electrons actually attracts and holds the metal lattice together. Now because these electrons are mobile, they can conduct electricity as well as heat and thus the d-block elements are good conductors of heat and electricity. These electrons can also absorb and emit light of various frequencies and this gives rise to the characteristic metallic luster that we see. The metal atoms can also slide under the influence of an external force, so we can actually beat them into thin sheets, they are malleable, and they can also be drawn into thin wires, that is, they are ductile. Now the metallic bonding in D-block is exceptionally strong and we'll talk more about this later on in the video. So these metals have high tensile strength. That is, they can be used to make wires that can carry really heavy loads. So the sea of electron theory suggests that if a metal atom has more number of valence electrons, then the metal grid will be more positively charged and therefore there will be a greater attraction between the sea of electrons and the metal grid. So the metal lattice will be stronger, right? The sea of electrons will be able to hold the metal lattice much more tightly so therefore, it is going to be difficult to break the metal. So if you want to, let's say, convert the metal from the solid state to the liquid state, you will need to provide more energy or more heat. So the melting point is going to be higher, right? This is very nicely reflected in the melting point data across the periodic table. Because the d-block elements have more valence electrons, remember even the d electrons take part in bonding out here, so the melting points as you can see is higher than that of the S block as well as the P block. Let us now take a look at how the melting point varies within the D block starting with the 3D series. So as we move from scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium all the way till zinc, the total number of D electron keeps increasing, right? So you might expect that because zinc has the highest number of electrons, highest number of valence electrons, it should have the highest melting point. Right. However, this is not true. Zinc has a melting point of only around 420 degrees Celsius, which is much lower compared to the other transition metals of the 3D series like chromium and manganese and others, whose melting point are around 1500 degrees Celsius. In fact, if you look carefully, you will realize that the melting point first seems to increase towards the middle of the 3D series and then it seems to decrease up to zinc. So why is this happening? Well, the sea of electron theory is actually an oversimplification. What's really happening is that when the atomic orbitals of the atoms in the metal lattice overlap, they actually form a giant molecular orbital. This molecular orbital actually permeates throughout the entire metal crystal and this is where the valence electrons reside. Because the molecular orbital is spread out throughout the entire metal lattice, the electrons can be present anywhere in this giant molecular orbital and this is the actual reason why they are free to move about throughout the crystal. I am sure you also know that when two atomic orbital combines, it actually forms two molecular orbitals, right? One is the bonding molecular orbital while the other one is antibonding. You also know that greater the number of electrons present in the bonding molecular orbital, stronger will be the bonds while electrons entering the antibonding molecular orbital will destabilize the bond. So electrons in bonding molecular orbital will want to stick the atoms together, while the ones in antibonding molecular orbital will try to pull them apart. Now in a metal lattice, there aren't only two atoms, right? There are in fact billions of metal atoms present in the lattice. So instead of having two molecular orbitals, we actually have billions of molecular orbitals each very closely spaced to each other in energy. The orbitals at the bottom are in fact lower in energy 
and they have more bonding characteristics while the orbitals at the top have more anti-bonding characteristics. Now these energy levels are in fact so closely spaced to each other that we can actually think of it as a continuous band of energy. Because the energy difference between individual molecular orbitals is so small, the electrons can readily jump from one molecular orbital to another. They can move around in this continuous energy band and this gives rise to the giant molecular orbital that I was talking about earlier. Now as we move from scandium to zinc across the 3D series, initially the valence electrons start entering the lower part of the band. And as the valence electron increases, the band starts getting filled up and it actually gets completely filled up by the time we reach zinc. So in zinc, the metallic bonding is weak as the electrons in bonding molecular orbital and antibonding molecular orbital almost cancel each other out. So zinc has the lowest melting point in the 3D series. Also, as you might have guessed, initially the bonding gets stronger as the electrons start filling up the lower energy bonding molecular orbital and it peaks at around chromium. In manganese, some of the orbitals with antibonding characteristics also start filling up. The bonding starts getting weaker and ultimately it tapers down in zinc. So therefore, in the 3D series, the melting point first increases and then decreases. Now I'm sure you must be thinking, what about the dip in manganese? Manganese has a lower than expected melting point, right? This is because besides the fact that some of the antibonding molecular orbitals start filling up with manganese, it also has a D5S2 electronic configuration. Now this half filled D5 and a fully filled S2 configuration is relatively stable. It is more stable than the D5S1 electronic configuration of chromium if you are thinking like that. And thus it is slightly more energetically unfavorable for the D orbitals to overlap and form molecular orbitals in case of manganese. So therefore manganese has a lower than expected melting point and that is why we see this particular dip. Now there is an interesting correlation out here that I'd like to mention as it is mentioned in most books. If you look at this melting point trend, you can actually correlate it to the number of unpaired electrons. So from scandium to titanium, vanadium, chromium, the number of unpaired electrons keeps increasing. It's actually maximum in manganese and then electron starts getting paired up and then the number of unpaired electrons keeps decreasing again, right? So therefore, there is this interesting correlationship between number of unpaired electrons and melting point. And you can say that metals having more unpaired electrons favor stronger metallic bonding. Of course, manganese is an exception out here, so let's keep that aside. Uh, but remember that correlation is not equal to causation. Nevertheless, it is an interesting trend. So now that we have seen how the melting point varies across the 3D series, what about the 4D and the 5D? Well, even out here, even out here, the melting point first increases, reaches a maxima around the middle of the series and then decreases. Just like in the 3D series where the maxima happens with chromium, in the 4D series, the maxima happens with molybdenum, which is immediately below chromium. And for the 5D series, the maxima is at tungsten. Now, if you look at this graph, you also realize that there is another important trend. As you are going from chromium to molybdenum to tungsten, the melting point is increasing, right? In fact, as you go from 3D to 4D to 5D, the melting point actually increases. Now this happens because the 4D as well as the 5D orbitals are much bigger. So therefore in the metal lattice, because they are more spread out, they can overlap much more effectively. And this increases the band width of the giant molecular orbital that we are talking about. So what happens is that because the orbitals interact much more, so therefore the energy level of the bonding molecular orbitals are much lower in case of 4D and even much lower in case of 5D. So therefore the metallic bonding is going to be much stronger in 4D and 5D. So if you look at a table once again, going from 3D to 4D to 5D, things change from yellow to red. So the melting point keeps increasing. 
and tungsten, rhenium and osmium has some of the highest melting points in the whole of the periodic table. Tungsten in fact has the highest melting point amongst all metals. So it's no wonder that tungsten is the material of choice when it comes to making incandescent bulbs as we can heat it to really high temperatures without worrying about what's going to happen to tungsten.